Good morning to you. How are, how are y'all doing this morning? We are fewer in number, uh, but we are strong in spirit. Amen? Amen. There we go. Uh, why don't we... Uh, we're going to do this. We've done this song before. It's been a while, and, and so Sherry and I can sort of do it as a duet, but we would love for you to sing with us if you once you've heard... Uh, uh, maybe a verse or so if you want to join in and sing feel free to do that if not she and I will sing all the way through another newer one that we've done. We did it a while back. Um, you, if you want to sing, stand on this one, you can do that or you can remain seated, whatever you would like. Yes. 
Well, this morning we are going to take just a one, possibly two week, um, two week uh, hiatus from Galatians. We're going to be looking at a couple of different passages of scripture this morning. I told you that we would. We would talk a little bit about the election this morning. And now, when I refer to that, I don't want you to think that I'm going to do a 30-minute conversation on why so-and-so won or why so-and-so lost. That, that's not my intent. It's not my intent at all. So we, if you're anticipating that, I'm um, sorry. Um, but you know that this pulpit is not supposed to be political. Amen. I mean, you've not called me here to promote a, a Republican, a, a, a Democratic, or an independent candidate, and I'm not going to do that this morning either. You know, the events of the last few weeks have really grabbed the attention of much of the world. And while the media has announced a winner in the Electoral College, we know that that's not actually official until each state certifies their election and the electors are sent to the House of Representatives and they are counted, they are tallied, and when that uh, person receives the 270, they will be named the, uh, the president-elect. Now, it may turn out that Joe Biden is the, is the president, in mind. I mean, and, and that's just the fact. It might turn out that the president remains for another four years. You know, for the last four years, the media and the, the De Democrat Party has done everything it could to diminish the election of Donald Trump, even choosing to follow a report that was thoroughly debunked. Um, and that's not a political statement by me. That, that's a fact. I mean, that, that's, there's evidence there to that effect. That effort held the nation's attention for much of President Trump's tenure. Then as 2020 came into view, the campaign season brought a new level of hatred and attention to the process from both sides, mind you. I mean, we cannot sit here and say that one party or the other um, is more evil than the other when it came to the election. There were some very ugly things that happened from both parties. And we know the coronavirus outbreak attracted every ounce of energy and attention as well then, and it continues to do the same today. Uh, the, the mayor of South Haven in the last couple of days is not real happy with the state of Mrs. the governor in our state for making some comments about uh, DeSoto County having the highest outbreak in the state. He's not happy about that at all. I don't know that I would be happy either, by the way. Uh, but it is, it is the truth. Well, when we talk about the counting of votes, the recount, mail-in votes, Ill illegal or legal votes, as they continue, it continues to keep the attention of at least some of the American people. There is no doubt about that. All you've got to do is turn on any of the mainstream media uh, news reports, and you can see that. Now, we're being told if, if you voted for one party, we're being told we should unify and, and just let's just move on. The other party, um, the other party is, is saying that, that for the good of the country, we need to do that. So what's an average citizen to do? What's an average citizen to do? Are, are, we, to, to, are we just to ignore um, irregularities in, in the vote process? And I would say no, we should not, we should not ignore them. Will it have any uh, outcome on the, on the election? I have no idea. Even if it doesn't though, I think you're with me that, that we should strive to have every legal vote Counted, even if that results in Joe Biden becoming the president or President Trump remaining for four more years. Amen. Amen. I mean, we live in a republic. And, and I will have zero trouble if, after the recounts and everything, if, if one candidate comes or the other candidate comes out the victor, I'm fine with that. And I have to be. That's what happens in a representative republic. We have been transitioning from 
uh, presidency to presidency every four to eight years or, uh, you know, in the, I don't, I don't remember when President Roosevelt was a president, but he, he repeated a couple of times, did he not? However, let's consider this for the next few minutes. Peace broke out in the Middle East due in large part to the strength of a great leader. This same leader brought prosperity that had never been seen before. The influence of the nation had not been felt to this level in many, many years. The military was stronger after years of neglect. The borders were strengthened as well as to an extent that they'd never seen before. The nation was, in fact, existing in a time that had never been better. And then amazingly, the president wasn't reelected. No. Amazingly, the king died. The king died. The time that I'm speaking about is in the rough time of 740 B.C. See, you thought I was referring all of that to the United States. You do understand, you do understand that just because we are a country, it doesn't mean that we are first in God's eyes. Amen? Amen. We've got, to, we've got to be willing to say that out loud, but what we're talking about was 740 B.C. Judah was having an unparalleled time of prosperity, of strength and influence. The king had ruled for 52 years. That's right, 52 years. His name was Uzziah. For the most part, he was a pretty good ruler. How he died is significant. And if you'll turn to 2 Chronicles for a minute, a book that doesn't really get a lot of good press at times because it, it doesn't, doesn't um, give us, doesn't give us sometimes what we really want to read, but it's got some great stories in it that all of them are true, obviously, because it's in the Word of God. But in 2 Chronicles, in chapter 26, chapter 26, and we are going to begin reading in verse 16. Now, what this passage is talking about is King Uzziah. But when he was strong, he grew proud, meaning Uzziah. He grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to Yahweh, his God, and entered the temple of Yahweh to burn incense on the altar of incense. Can I tell you that as great as Uzziah was, it was not his place to enter the temple and to burn incense on that altar of incense. He violated the law of God. But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 of the priests of the Lord who were men of valor, valor, and they withstood the king, Uzziah, and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Now, he had been king for decades, and it's obvious he felt that he had a special prerogative to do what he wanted to do. Verse 19, Uzziah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and when he became angry with the priest, Leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priest in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him. Behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they rushed him out quickly. And he himself hurried to go out because the Lord had struck him. And King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And being a leper, lived in a separate house, for he, was for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's household. 
governing the people of the land. God has no equal. Uzziah thought he had special privilege because he had been the king for 52 years. And kings don't get told no very often. And it's obvious he had not been told. But just think about this. So we see Uzziah attempted to do something only the priests were allowed to do. God killed the guy. He killed him. Surely Uzziah was important enough to Judah that God would just wink at his indiscretion, but actually his arrogance regarding the law brought this leprosy on him. Now, I want you to think not for a minute about Uzziah. We, we, we get it. He disobeyed God brazenly, and God struck him with leprosy and killed him. There's not a whole lot more to be said there. And it's not funny, but I'm just saying and that's, that's pretty, pretty uh, straightforward there. I want you to think for a minute about the people of Judah. They had experienced prosperity and strength and influence to an extent that had not been seen ever under the reign of Uzziah. And Uzziah had brought them to a point where when people around that area heard the word Judah, it meant something. And they had one man, basically, the people of Judah had one man that they attributed to everything, and that was Uzziah. And God killed him. God killed him. Imagine if we had had a president for 52 years and it had been marked with extreme economic success, military power, foreign policy successes, movement toward policies that honored allies, honoring life, promoting freedom. Now imagine that president being yanked away suddenly. Now, we don't really have to imagine that. In, in the opinion of many people, it was what was occurring in the last four years, and it, it appears to be in exact opposition to what might occur in the next four. If you'll turn to the book of Isaiah for a moment. What did the prophets, what did the nation of Judah need? What did they do? Isaiah, Isaiah can tell us what happened? And, and, and honestly, there is only one thing that is going to unify this country, and it's not Joe Biden, Biden yelling for that to happen. It's not for President Trump yelling for that to happen. You do understand, it looks like 74 million people voted for Joe Biden, and 72 million people voted for President Trump. We are as divided a nation as we possibly could be. We are. I, and if you voted for Joe Biden, that's fine. This isn't about Joe Biden, and it's not about President Trump. That's our problem as a nation and as believers, frankly. What can we learn from yesterday and how we should respond to today's events? Well, look there, beginning in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 6. It says there, in the year that King Uzziah died. So, so right there, we've already mentioned this, the year was in around 70, 740 B.C. and we know that Uzziah, if you look at Chronicles, he, he, he was reigning for roughly 52 years and the attention of Judah had been absolutely on this one man for those 52 years. And, you know, I mean, we could say right and so on. He had provided for them in a number of different ways. It, but the death of Uzziah had to shock the very life out of the people of Judah. The nation, after Uzziah dies, begins to decline. In fact, the decline actually started a little bit before Uzziah died. 
But it definitely began to it further decline after his death. And the nation of Assyria began to increase along with another nation that uh, was founded around that same time in the 750 to 740 range, which eventually would take over the known world, Rome. And while Judah and Israel were declining, those other two were beginning to increase. So imagine all these events taking place around Judah. Everything was pointing to decline. The nation was distraught. And look what happened as Isaiah writes. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Can I tell you something to that? That is the only thing that is going to heal our country. Not a Republican. Not a Democrat. Not an Independent. And for anybody that thinks just because President Trump was in for four years that that gets us in good standing with God, they are sadly mistaken. Do you think for a minute that God is somehow constrained by four years of a presidency by a human being? It's ridiculous. Now, all of us, I, I mean, on election night, I was a little bit down. I'll just be honest with you. Carolyn can affirm that I was a little bit down. And through the next about 18 hours or so, I was so very convicted. I was so very convicted. As though the fact that Joe Biden being president might somehow hamper the purposes, the providence, the sovereignty of God in heaven. How foolish is it? And we Christians ought to know better. It tells you where our hope seems to be that it's in Washington in the Republican or the Democrat Party. Can I tell you, I think that's why churches across the country are declining and dying because we are more interested in the politics of this nation than the souls of our neighbors. We're quick to pass email. We're quick to talk about this and that when it comes to politics. But for some reason, we can't talk about sin and the glory of a risen Savior with those same people. God, help us. I can tell you that Isaiah was stopped in the very midst of this, and he saw something that changed his life. Have you seen that? Have you seen that? I can tell you this. Churches across this country are going to die from COVID. And there are churches out there that probably ought to die from COVID. Because their lampstand has been removed. And where are we in that? Can I tell you that once you have a vision of the Lord God sitting on his throne that is holy, 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 we immediately have to respond to that vision. And if we don't, we're no different than Uzziah. We're no different from Uzziah. So when we look at this passage, it's a very curious statement when he says, I saw the Lord. I thought no man could look on God and what? Live. Live. That's right. What are we supposed to do with that? Is there an error in the word of God? We know that when Moses was there on, on the mountain and, 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 and Moses wanted to see God, God told him no, but you, know, you can sort of see the, the phrase there is hinder parts, not his glory, not his essence. But where he had been was the idea there. John 1.18. Turn over into John. We're going to be flipping through a little bit. John wrote this. He said, no one has ever seen God. 
The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. I love that phrase there. Basically, that first 18 verses of the first chapter of John reveals to us that if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus Christ. Look at Him. But there's another curious passage there. So what do we do with that? This vision, the, the text doesn't tell us exactly how he saw him. Was it just a vision? Was it a dream? Was it seen with his physical eye? We don't know. We know when it says there, back in Isaiah 6, that, that it says there, I saw the Lord. That word Lord there is the Hebrew word Adonai. The word Adonai has that idea of sovereign, one who is able to do what he proposes to do. It's applied to God in an absolute, unrestricted manner. So what did Isaiah see? Look over in John again. It doesn't surprise me that we have these references to Jesus as God all throughout the gospel there, but specifically in John 12, if you'll look with me, and then go to verse Go to verse 39, 12, 39. Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart in turn, and I would heal them. Verse 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Whom did Isaiah see there in Isaiah 6? He saw a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's called a Christophany in theology. That God proposed and showed Isaiah something. Why? Because the nation of Judah was desperate. It was divided. It was doomed. It was depraved. I can't think of any more deeds. But it was all of those things. And all of a sudden, the Lord broke through all of that confusion. And Isaiah saw him. He saw him. Look at what it says. He saw him sitting upon a throne. Can I tell you? Can I tell you this, that when, when the mainstream media called Arizona for uh, Joe Biden the other night, Jesus didn't get up off of his throne and start wringing his hands. and, and He's he not doing this. The fact that he was sitting on his throne implies governance, rulership. In the midst of the chaos of the nations, in the midst of the death of this this long-tenured king in the midst of the decline of Judah and the ascendancy of Assyria and Rome, guess what? Isaiah saw the Adonai and he was sitting on his throne. Can I tell you today, God remains on his throne. And we cannot forget that. Joe Biden or Donald Trump, either one, you understand what I'm, I'm not saying, this is not some plea for uh, President Trump to remain the president. He may. But if he doesn't, we're okay. And if President Trump does stay, we're okay. This isn't about either one of those men. And Isaiah is telling us that even Today, Jesus is still on his throne. Do you think for a moment, and I mentioned this a moment, a moment ago, that any candidate in any country can thwart the plans of a sovereign king? Then we Christians need to stop acting like all of our hope and all of our faith and all of our, our trust is when we push the lever for a republic. Can I actually tell you that we're illegal aliens in this country? Amen? Amen. 
We are. Our citizenship, if you're a believer, is already in heaven. Now, we need to be good citizens. Don't get me wrong. Am I telling you not to vote? No. I mean, we're supposed to be good citizens and live peaceably among all men, as far as it depends on us. And it's not wrong of you or me to want a particular candidate to win an election. That's not wrong. It might become wrong if you would be willing to do anything to get that person into office. That would be wrong. So, Jesus is still on his throne. If you move to the New Testament, we can see in the writings of Paul that we are to submit to the authorities that are over us. Your immediate comment might be, you don't really know how evil Joe Biden is. Or you don't understand how evil Donald Trump is. Can I, can I ask you one simple question? Who was ruling the Mediterranean, when Paul was living, the Romans. Have you read about the Roman Caesars and how wicked those men were almost to a person? There were a few that were okay, but they still ruled with an iron fist. And the Caesar was its leader. This vision of Isaiah continues, and as he wrote there, <clears throat> that his throne is high and lifted up, and that is the idea of a king or a judge, and his robe was so massive that it filled the temple, and there was no room for anybody else in that room. And what has Isaiah said so far? Nothing. Isaiah is silent. Because our attention at this point, Isaiah's attention to this point, all of a sudden it looks like to me he has forgotten about Uzziah. Because there was a greater vision that overtook him. He was not thinking about King Uzziah, but he was thinking about King Jesus. Look at verse 2 there. He says, above him, meaning Adonai, above him stood the seraphim, the burning ones. This is the only spot in the Old Testament where the word seraphim occurs. They are pictured here. We could go into what each thing means, means but I'm not going to do that this morning. They, they give us a description there, but what I like about it is they stand ready to serve God, but there is one function of the seraphim here, and that is to praise Jehovah. That is their continuous occupation. They kept on crying out to him, and look at the message there. Their message was holy, holy, holy. That word holy signifies the entirety of, of divine perfection that separates God from his creation. He is the Lord and he is not a man. Although creation and every created being entirely depend on him, he himself is entirely independent of his creation. And that whole idea of holiness there also tells us that there is a separation from what is sinful. The, the, the seraphim then say, the whole earth is full of his glory. Another way to phrase that is this, his glory is the fullness of the earth, asserting that the entirety of creation and not merely the whole earth is his glory. God's creation is so wonderful and beautiful that if a person just pauses and thinks about the created order, they should be able to say, there is a God. And if they do, Romans 1, 19 and 20 tells us that they are without excuse. Verse 4. Look at the effects. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. 
and the house was full of smoke. It, this is just incomparable majesty that Isaiah sees. Again, where's King Uzziah in Isaiah's vision? He's nowhere to be found at this point. And there's also smoke there in this temple, implying that Isaiah is in the presence of God. So, so we have, we have, Isaiah has seen the Lord. He has seen him sitting on the throne. We, we see Isaiah re reporting that God is on his throne. That it, there are seraphim who are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We finally get a little bit of a response in verse 5. And I said, Woe is me. Isaiah, once having seen this picture of God, his holiness burst out into an agonizing cry. Woe, or calamity falls, or is about to fall on me. He recognizes that he is undone. Can I tell you that when you and I understand who God truly is. That is the only response a human being can have in the presence of a holy God. The response of God to your sin and my sin is that he will strike us dead. I mean, that's the truth of it, folks. Boy, that doesn't sound like a very loving message this morning. It's, it actually is. The most loving thing that I can tell somebody who is outside the gospel of Christ is that they are already separated from God right now, but they're getting ready to spend eternity separated from Him. That's the most loving thing that you can tell somebody. In fact, if you refuse to share the gospel with people, you are telling them you hate them and want them to receive their just judgment. That's not the gospel. Isaiah recognizes he's, he's been made to cease. He's cut off. He is doomed to die, is what he says there. He says... Woe is me, I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See, Isaiah knew that the sinfulness of the nation, it, it would allow that nation to, to call out to Uzziah in their sin. But he knew that their own sinfulness prohibited them from crying out to God because they were not fit to utter his praise. Isaiah felt doomed. Because he had seen the king. This nation, until it repents, will not see what we absolutely needed to see. And look, I will make even a stronger comment. Until the church in the United States repents, we will not see revival like we desperately want. Folks, the problem, the problem with our nation are not, is not lost people. The problem with our nation are weak churches that are filled with weak Christians that have not seen the holiness of a God who is ready to crush sin. That's our problem. 
in the basic evangelical church, you probably get tired of me saying this, across this country is winking at sin and at God at the same time. What this nation really needs is a vision of the holiness of God. They will not see that unless they see that in us. You know, you might say, well, you know, we're a small church. I agree. But Jesus took 11 men and he added a 12th after Judas left and committed suicide. And we're sitting here as a result of those 12 men. Don't tell me we're a small church and that keeps us from being faithful to Jehovah. Don't tell me that. That's an excuse. That's an excuse. What does the United States need to see? It needs to see Emory Church serious about the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, and the lostness of our neighbors. Amen? When that happens, our vision will be on what it needs to be on. And we won't be so wrapped up in politics that we forget if you voted Republican, for many Republicans, they view Democrats as the enemy. And if you voted Democrat, Democrats tend to look at Republicans as the enemy. What did Jesus say for us to do with our enemies? Love them. But if we're too fast and too free calling people our enemy, we're forgetting that they are our mission. Folks, that's the only thing that is going to change our country. It's, it's the only thing. Charles, West, Charles and John Wesley both said that if you gave them a hundred men who hated sin and nothing else, they would change the world. I believe that. And the world is still waiting to see that happen. We have roughly about 100 people that come off and on here in this church. Now next Sunday we're going to talk about what are some other things that Isaiah saw and how does it apply to us in 2020. Let's pray for it. Father, we do thank you for this, <clears throat> for this day that you have given us. Lord, we, we confess to you that our eyes have not been on you. Or in, in this day of technology and all the things that surround it, or we, we are just sort of built for ADD, for attention deficit disorder. And we can focus on you for, you know, maybe 30 minutes a week. And that's about it. God, I just pray that we as a church would see what Isaiah saw and we would be forever changed. We ask that that would start within each one of us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we pray together? If you'll stand with me, we'll be dismissed. <coughs> Father, we do come to you again as we close our time of worship. Lord, we, we would pray that, that our singing, that our hearts, that our, our preaching, the, the reading of the Word of God, that those things would be pleasing to you. Lord, we acknowledge that we're not the people that we need to be, but I'm grateful that day by day we can become what you've called us to be. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would um, be actively involved in that pursuit. Lord, we pray for these that we've mentioned. There are many needs here. Um, a lot of physical needs uh, from cancer treatment, from 
uh, surgeries from COVID. Um, so we just, we ask that you would give grace to, to grieving as well. We ask you to give grace to those folks. And that as we pray for them, if we can help meet needs there, that we would do that. And we do pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You're just